federal way How do you find those coefficients? 
It's not a rhetorical question. That is a question to you. You solve the short equation with the boundary condition. So you, in this case, you have to find what the wave is inside the well. You match at this boundary, you match at that boundary. That those boundary conditions involve the continuity of the wave function, and the continuity of its derivative, and you solve it and you find those coefficients. Okay, so that's a problem that you have in homework, which you've all done because it's due today. Um, all right. We're going to study this kind of problem in more detail in three dimensions next semester, where there, again, the problem isn't what is the energy eigenvalue, it's all are allowed. The problem is about something related to the strength of the scattering of a particle off of another particle or off of a scattering center, as we call it. And typically what we're interested in solving for is the scattering cross-section. Okay? So we're going to talk about that next semester um, in greater detail. We might touch on it a little bit later on this semester. For the bound states, what we're interested in is you know, the bound, bound state energies, because there are only certain ones that are allowed. We're interested in what the energy eigenvalues are, because not all are allowed. And um, also, typically, we're interested in what the eigenfunctions are as well. Uh, so we have a, a few factoids. One is that in 1D, there are no, it's impossible to have a degeneracy unless the wave function vanishes in some finite range between my Then it's possible. But otherwise, the eigenfunctions are not degenerate. Okay? In 1D, okay? Well, that's not true in higher dimensions, higher spatial dimensions. Moreover, the lowest energy level, what we call the ground state, the wave function has no nodes. And each successive bound state has one more node. So those are some little factoids. Um, if the potential is reflection symmetric, then what we can say in that case is that the Hamiltonian is invariant or commutes with the parity operator. And because the Hamiltonian commutes with the parity operator, and because, unless under some very bizarre circumstances, there are no degeneracies, the eigenfunctions of the Hamiltonian must also be eigenfunctions of parity. So the wave functions corresponding to bound states are parity eigenstates. That is to say, they're symmetric or uh, anti-symmetric functions under reflection through the origin. And because of this uh, fact that they're, you know, they go from no nodes to one node to two nodes to three nodes, they alternate. Ground state is an even parity solution, odd, even odd, etc. Et okay. Of course, the simplest problem is the particle in a box where we think about hard wall boundary conditions case, and there it has to be that the wave function has to go to zero at the walls, and then we have simple alternating cosines and sines, right? Um, and the energy eigenvalues are just a, a squared, h bar squared 2m times the wave vector for the n eigenvalue squared. Now, I just want to emphasize one point here. Of course, we should be able to use the uncertainty principle just qualitatively to estimate what we expect the ground state energy to be in the problem. We should be able to do that without going through matching boundary conditions just from our intuition, physical intuition about the problem. 
just from the uncertainty principle, how would you think I have any suggestions about that? Yes, please. Would the uncertainty in the position be you know, the width of the box? Right. So the, lo the, 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 the particle is localized. So, you know, just qualitatively. Qualitatively. For the ground state, we expect the, un the uncertainty in the position is on the order of the width of the box, right? So what would then, how would you then estimate what the, uh, um, ground state energy is. Well, the energy is, yeah, go on. Uh, uh, please, no. something like, that, like using the, the, the weight number? Related to the sure, exactly. So the weight number is related to the momentum, right? I mean, just physically, the energy of the system is the kinetic energy and the potential energy, right? Now in here we could say, let's call this energy potential zero, okay? So inside this well, the energy is just kinetic, right? And what would you say then, what can we say with what this value of p squared is? Well, for the, for the ground state, this is the expected value of p squared for the ground state. Yeah? Um, going back to the uncertainty for a second. Yeah. If we assume in this system is in a minimal uncertainty position, we are already, uh, because we're in a box, we already know what the momentum localized in the box must be, right? Uh -huh. Just h bar over 2 L, right? So we don't have to, we don't know for sure if it's a minimum of certain state, but we could say it's on that order, and that's a good thing. So we could say just from the uncertainty principle that this is on the order of that, right? Excellent. And so what is the energy of the ground state then? Well, this is just the spread in momentum, right? Because the mean momentum is zero. So this is h bar squared over 2 ml squared, which is basically what this is, which factors of pi. It's not exactly that because, you know, it's not an uncertainty state and all that. But that is a kind of back of the envelope calculation everyone should be able to do. Okay? Now, what would you say happens? Suppose I have a finite square well. Okay, so now this is some finite depth, not infinity. The same way. What would you say happens to the ground state energy? Is does it go up or down relative to the infinite square well with hard walls? If the ground state's below V um, the V naught or if it's cut off, will the ground state not notice the change in the in the potential wall wall? It will, because it tunnels. Oh. Right? So what does the ground state look like in this case? Well, it's got a little bit of an evanescent tail. Okay? So the, what happens to the uncertainty in x in this case? Does it go up or down relative to this case? It goes up. It's slightly bigger, right? So the uncertainty in x is now, you know, it's bigger than l. The details are there. So what happens to the uncertainty in P? It goes down. It goes down. <laughs> what it was for the for this infinite square well. Which means the ground state energy go, does what? It goes down. 
So the ground state energy for the finite square well has to be less than the ground state energy for the infinite square well. This, this brings up an interesting concept that if the well gets shallower and shallower, the, 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 I'm sorry, then the momentum will go to zero. It will get smaller and smaller and smaller. It doesn't go to zero in this case, in fact. In fact, in this problem, there is always one bound state. No matter how shallow the well, there's always one bound state. That's true for this. There's always a solution. No matter how shallow the well is, there's always a solution. It's barely bound, but it's bound. Okay. Always one bound state in this case. You can always find a solution to this kind of problem, at least one. In fact, you're looking at the opposite problem in your homework where you have infinitely small width, where you might think the momentum gets infinitely high, but it doesn't because of the way the width goes. There's always you know, this bound state here for the delta potential. Okay, now I'll ask you one last question about this kind of problem. Suppose I have this kind of well. So this goes up to infinity. You've got a hard well right at the origin, but then a finite well be not at this distance. Can you tell me what you expect the solutions to that to be like? Well, uh, there, this is not reflection symmetric, right? This is not a, this, only, you only have sines and cosines inside the well if their eigenstates are parity. This is not a reflection symmetric potential. But it doesn't have to be zero on the wall. But it does have to be. The, the, the wave function does have to go to zero right there. I agree. But maybe I'll give you a hint. This potential is what I have with the finite well, and then I put a wall right in the middle. Right? So, given the solutions to this problem, etc., can you tell me what the solutions to this problem are? Does that have to be signed just because you need that node? It's the odd parity pieces. So, there is a solution that looks like this, which would have been like that. So the odd parity solution of the finite well has exactly the right boundary conditions to put a hard wall right in the middle. So this problem has all the odd parity solutions Center of this well, right? 
They haven't, they're not, they're these solutions. This well does not have reflection symmetry. But I, they are the odd parity parts of this on the half line. There are no ones on that, any part of the line which are just the even solutions filtered out that doesn't exist. Yes? Now, I don't know if it's an artifact of the picture, but was there was like a, a delta potential in the middle of that one that you drew? The, or no, it's just... Like, I mean, you were just drawing the other half of the symmetric well. Yeah. It wasn't like a delta function with potential at infinity right at zero. Do you see what I'm trying to say? No. But that was just a, a delta function potential is not an infinite hard wall. Okay. Okay. So it was just... That's, it's, it's a, this thing is a wall. There's a potential here and then this goes up to infinity. Okay. Okay. And this goes on forever. Right. Okay. Uh, the delta function is just a spike. Okay. The delta function would have been this goes back down and then it's a spike. I think I was confused by the axis. Okay. Right, and then it could tunnel out. That's not bad. <coughs> okay, last question about this duty. I said in this problem, no matter how shallow the potential is, there is always one bound state. You could always find a solution which satisfies the boundary conditions. What about this guy with this going off to infinity? Is the ground state always even though? No. The ground state always has no nodes. It's only even if the potential itself is reflection symmetric. This is not a reflection symmetric potential. These eigenfunctions are not eigenfunctions of parity. Yeah. So there, the, the ground state would be the lowest that you drew them. Yeah, and does it, can, as I lower the depth of this potential, does that, is that, is it always possible to have a bound state? No. No. Why not? Because that's even. Because this guy disappears. And this guy is not this guy. So because of that hard work, as I try to squeeze this guy in, it just can't make the boundary conditions. There's just no way to do it. So it's not the case that every finite square well always has a bound state. This guy, there is a minimum depth in order to minimum depth, such that the solution, once I lower it too much, boop, pops out of the well. There's just no bound states at all. This case with the hard wall at the origin is important because it relates to the motion in 3D where this axis is now the radius from the origin. Okay, if I think about the problem of in 3D where I separate coordinates, let's say spherical coordinates, then R only exists on the half line from zero to infinity. And so when we talk about, as we will, about bound states in 3D and scattering in 3D, the, the fact that there's, only, there's finite numbers of, of uh, bound states has important implications for, say, scattering in 3D, which we will discuss. All right. Very good. So that was our lightning review of piecewise constant potentials and the like in great mechanics. What we're going to now turn our attention to for about a week or so is the mo one of the most important problems of a well in 1D, the simple harmonic.
Um, why? Well, firstly, uh, if I have any binding potential, or I would say most any binding potential, not all, but most, that's finite curvature. At minimum. So I might have, you know, a binding potential, say, for a molecule that looks like this as a function of position. But near the minimum of the potential, this thing is approximately quadratic. So as long as the particle is not moving too far up the potential, near the equilibrium point, it undergoes simple harmonic motion. So when we talk about, for example, vibrational spectra of molecules, it's a good approximation. Often we can approximate that by harmonically bound atoms, bound together in the interatomic potential that binds them. Um, so that's one reason. Another important reason is, of course, field theory. So in field theory, we talk about quantum fields, or fields, let me say it another way, sorry. The degrees of freedom are the normal modes. So if I have waves on a string, waves moving on surface of water, I can always decompose them into normal modes. And those normal, the dynamics of those normal modes are the dynamics are those of a simple harmonic oscillator. I will always call the SHO. show. So when we talk about field theory, which maybe we'll do at the very end of the academic year, uh, we talk about the modes of the field, and they are described by simple harmonic oscillators. So that's a whole lot of important reasons. There's one other important reason that we'll see is that it's a natural forum for formulating quantum mechanics in phase space, as to say, in the coordinates of X and P together. We already saw a taste of this, which I hinted we do with the homework in the finger function. Uh, but we'll get a little more deeper into that discussion as we go along. Okay. All right, so let's simple harmonic oscillator. We all know it, of course. So uh, the Hamiltonian, let's talk about this, this problem first classically. The Hamiltonian kinetic energy and potential energy. The potential energy of the system, well, for a simple harmonic oscillator, the force is, you know, the spring constant times x. That's a simple harmonic oscillator. And it gives a natural resonance frequency, square root of kappa over n. Uh, and the potential energy is 1 half kappa 
squared, right? And with that, we are always, almost always right in terms of the oscillation frequency rather than the square. So we have a harmonic potential. And we typically take potential energy to be zero at the origin. The equations of motion, Hamilton's equations of motion. Equations of motion. x dot is p over m, and p dot is minus the gradient uh, force Characteristic unit, characteristic scales of the problem. That's the first thing you should do in analyzing any physics problem. Any physics problem has associated some characteristic units, some characteristic scales. And one should always express all physical quantities in terms of those characteristic scales. So now I'm going to go on my diatribe against SI units, which has to happen once a um, you know, if you want to have a standardized set of units, that's fine if you're, you know, an engineer and you want to make sure all the screws fit into the space shuttle the right way. But it doesn't mean you should measure everything you're doing in SI units all the time, because there are other scales, there are natural units. If we're talking about high energy field theory at the Grand Unified Scale, we talk about the Planck scale. We don't talk about things in terms of kilometers, you know. If we're talking about uh, atomic physics, there's the Bohr radius. And think there's characteristic scales in the problem, which is why Fahrenheit is so much better than Celsius. Why in the world do I care where water boils when I'm talking about the weather? It's nothing to do with, I know when it's hot. Hot is 100, not whatever, you know. And I should measure my size in feet. Because a foot is how big I am. What's a centimeter? What does a centimeter have to do with my height? So that's why it makes much more sense, in my view. So come on, camera. I've said it many times. <laughs> <laughs> Metric is stupid for measuring people. All right. So <laughs> that's how a physicist should be. All right. So what are these characteristic scales? Um, so let's, the way you go about the problem, one way to do it sort of systematically is to say the following. Let's say there's a characteristic So there's a, okay, let's call XC the characteristic length, PC the characteristic momentum, and DC the characteristic energy. Okay, there's some characteristic scales of the problem. So I'm going to define dimensionless uh, variables. The position I'll call capital X is the position in units of the characteristic. Okay. And the momentum coordinate in phase space is dimensionless, and I'll call the dimensionless Hamiltonian so 
let's uh, then plug that in over here. And what it says is dimension is Hamiltonian is equal to the characteristic momentum squared over the characteristic energy and the mass times one half p squared plus uh, the mass omega squared, the characteristic point squared over the characteristic energy times one half x squared. Just factoring out all the units. Now, where you put that factor of two is the bane of my existence. I have many things, but that's one of them because it just drives you crazy when you see this square root of two float around. But so I'm going to not put the factors of two in here. Um, so one way to define the characters of units is to say, well, this is of order one. That just defines a relationship between what I'm calling the characteristic energy and the characteristic momentum and the characteristic energy. Right? So I'm going to define the characteristic units, define the scales. The characteristic energy, whatever it is, is whatever the characteristic momentum over n, which has got it, should be the same. So this is a relationship between these, these guys. So it's, this sets the scale. It doesn't define them yet because uh, I have two equations with three unknowns. I still I need one more thing. We'll have that soon. Okay. So with that said, uh, we can say the following. Let's look at what the dimensionless position in units of the characteristic scale is. What is its time derivative as a function of time? Okay? So that's equal to the characteristic momentum uh, over mass over there divided by the characteristic scale times that. And according to, to that, that's thus equal. Putting all that together, you get this. Similarly, p dot is equal to minus m omega squared, the characteristic this over the characteristic momentum x, which is minus omega. So in dimensionless units, we have the dimensionless Hamiltonian is one half x squared plus p squared, and x dot is uh, plus omega p, and p dot is minus. second derivative of this
as usual. And x dot is omega p dot, so this is p dot is 0 times omega, so we have the following solutions. <coughs> x of t is x of 0 cos omega t plus p of 0 sine omega t and p of t is equal to p of 0 cos omega t and p dot is minus omega x so this is minus x dot So the trajectory in phase space, written in terms of these dimensionless canonical coordinates, is what? It's a circle. It's a circle. Indeed, it's a circle. of the circle, which is what? Well, it's equal to uh, the square root of x0 squared plus z0 squared. Is this circle going clockwise? or counterclockwise. Alright, so what's happening to P as a function of time? P is decreasing. Right? So it's going in this direction. Right? So it's going clockwise. So this phaser, this 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 is phase space, but I can also think about this as a complex space. This is a phasor. And it has a, its phase is changing as e to the minus i. Omega that's why in physics we always use e to the minus i omega t, because that's the direction it's going in phase space. The phase is decreasing. All right. Well, this gives us a hint that we can define this in terms of complex amplitudes. Whenever you have sines and cosines, you can always define that in terms of the real or imaginary parts of some complex amplitude. And that complex amplitude, so this is the trajectory in phase space. It's a circle. The energy of the system, by the way, is what? Well, it's one half. constant. Whatever the initial energy is, is the energy at all times. So this says that we should define a complex amplitude. And this is where that stupid factor of two becomes confusing. One that isn't here. Let me define alpha. It's a complex number. It's a function of time. Whose real part is related to x, and whose imaginary part is related to p. If it were just that, it would just be that vector. But we're going to put in the square root of two inside there. Okay? So that x of t is the real part of alpha times root 2. And p of t is the imaginary part of alpha times root 2. 
Should A have, have a hundred two over two there as well? But A is x of t squared plus p of t squared, there should be a two there. Well, I don't know what, what I, I'm just saying that that's it. Uh, you're right. If this is this depends what I'm defining A, but you're, you're absolutely right. It, it does lie in that plane. But I, that must be the case, because that's what's the case. I said times root two, not all over two. It is over root two. It's over root two because that's where the energy is constant. Right? That's correct. Because that is the trajectory of constant energy. Right. Indeed. And so that's exactly why we put it this way. So the energy of the system is uh, in fact equal to alpha star alpha. Magnitude of alpha squared, which is a squared. All right. Oh, it's of course it's true at any time, but in this case, alpha. But this product is constant. What is alpha of t? Well, let's plug that in. Let's plug in these guys. We have x of t and p of t. When you plug that in, you get the following. little assignment for you to try that. Okay. This is what we call, so this is A e to the i phi, where A is the square root, the magnitude of alpha, that's the square root of And phi is the argument. It's the arctangent of the imaginary part over the real part. So what we have is the solution to the motion of the particle in phase space is alpha of t is equal to alpha of 0 e to the minus i omega t, where we have alpha of 0 is x plus i t at time equals 0 over 2. And the position of the particle at time t is the real part of alpha times your 2. And the momentum is the imaginary part of alpha. So we can always think about harmonic motion as the motion of a phaser in phase space that just rotates at the angular velocity omega clockwise. Projected on the x-axis, we have harmonic motion back and forth at frequency omega. Projected on the momentum axis, we have 90 degrees out of phase harmonic motion. So if we have two harmonic motions that are 90 degrees out of phase with one another, that's a circle. Of course, we know that the momentum is 90 degrees out of phase with momentum because when the kinetic energy goes to zero, potential energy is maximum. When potential energy goes to zero, the um, kinetic energy is maximum. This is all classical physics. However, now we want to 
quantize. Are some quantize. Yes, please. Um, the fee right there for a, yeah. is that like an initial displacement? That's exactly what it is. So it's just the initial, so if we go back to this picture, let's say at time t equals zero, we have some initial, uh, we have our spring, it some, has some initial displacement, and then we have a ball p hammer and we give it a kick. So we have some initial momentum and some initial position. This is phi zero. And then the guy rotates. So this phi is the initial phase in this phase plane. And then it, at a function of time, oscillates. Good questions. Excellent. All right. On to quantum mechanics. scales now. What is the natural unit? What we should have is that the characteristic action of the problem should be h bar. Put that together with what we have over there. So we had EC is equal to Tc squared over m was m omega squared times the characteristic scale of length. You put all that together, and you get the following. The characteristic energy scale is exactly how you would expect it, h bar omega. The characteristic momentum scale is whatever the mass is times the characteristic energy scale times the square root of that's pc squared. That's the square root of h bar and omega. And the characteristic length scale, so it's the momentum scale over h bar, square root of n. So just from this kind of dimensionless analysis or dimen analysis of scales, we have a kind of sense of kind of what we expected from the same picture we had here of a particle in a box. And just think about what the characteristic scales were. From that we said, oh, there's a length, so there's a momentum uncertainty. We kind of can guess what the, gra uh, you know, sort of on what order, what's the ground state energy of the harmonic oscillator approximately, and what is the width in position momentum, and here they are. And we'll see if, of course, you know that star close. We'll get to those. Uh, so that's a kind of analysis that every good physicist should be able to do. Your 
All right, moving along. Uh, um, bless you. So our Hamiltonian, if, again, we're going to define our dimensionless position and momentum. It's equal to uh, whatever the position operator in units of this characteristic plane scale and a dimensionless momentum operator given my scaling the dimension full momentum operator by that scale. And the commutator of dimensionless x with the dimensionless p relative to this, these scales is i h bar divided by the product of those scales which is i. Alright. Our Hamiltonian operator, kinetic operator and momentum operator plus I'm sorry, kinetic momentum operator and potential energy. In scaling out the units is h bar of omega times x squared plus p squared over 2. Notice the thing about the harmonic oscillator, and this goes to the point I made about phase space, because the potential energy is quadratic and, moment, and the kinetic energy is quadratic. It's symmetric in X and P, which is why, what makes it kind of a natural forum for talking about phase space in quantum mechanics. All right. Now, what about this? We have a non-hermitian operator that plays an important role here. And that is the quantized version of the complex amplitude. The complex amplitude is a complex number. Classically, quantumly, it's a non-permission operator. So I'm going to define the operator A as 1 over root 2 x plus i t. It's just the quantized version of the complex amplitude. or the short of a picture, I don't care. Okay, that operator, uh, remember that A does not equal A dagger. A dagger is X minus I. Moreover, A is not a normal operator, meaning it does not commute if it's adjoint. Let us calculate the commutator of A with A dagger. Plugging it in. So I get, factoring out the root twos, Minus I over 2 
the commutator of x with b, and then plus i over 2, the commutator of p with x. Right? And the commutator of x with p in dimensionless units is uh, i. Thank you very much. So i times minus i is plus 1. And this is negative i. Negative i. Negative i times i is. So what we get is the canonical commutation relations relative to the quantized complex amplitudes alpha and alpha star no longer commute. Or a a dagger no longer commute. And the commutator is a famous one. Commutator of a a dagger. Moreover, if we look at our Hamiltonian and we plug in A and A dagger, over here we get the following. This is equal to A bar omega, A dagger A plus A, A dagger over 2. Whereas classically, we said somewhere here, where did we say it? Okay. Oh, thank you. That the Hamiltonian, which is alpha star alpha, quantumly, because these guys don't commute, you have to symmetrize it. So you have the equivalent of alpha star alpha plus alpha alpha star over two. And that, I mean, I don't do that by fiat, that's how it comes out <laughs> when you plug in. A and A, we plug in X and P in terms of A and A dagger. Remember, X is the real part, which is alpha plus alpha, or the Hermitian part, I should say, times root 2. And P is the anti Hermitian part, which is A minus A dagger over 2i times root 2, which is that. So you plug these guys into this guy, and you get this. Which, if I use the commutator, A with A dagger, put it the other way, I get A dagger A plus F1, so I get this is the A bar omega, A dagger A. Things you have all seen before, but in a different light. All right. So, um, as you know, the equivalent of the complex amplitude squared, which is alpha, the magnitude of alpha squared, quantizes a dagger a. This operator we call n. So n is the quantum version of the magnitude of the amplitude squared related to the energy of the oscillator. Okay. So n is defined to be a dagger a. This is Hermitian. It has eigenvalues and eigenvectors. This permission we can always diagonalize. So there exists a set of eigenvectors with eigenvalues I'll call lambda to start. Well, that's 
A dagger A commuted with A. How do you do that? Yeah, you pull out the one that the first guy, well, that does that commute, that's okay, and you put that guy on that side. So that's A dagger A, A. And this is one. negative one. Negative one. Thank you. And the commutator between N and A dagger do the same trick or rooney. Pull out the A dagger. You're left with the commutator of A with A dagger. That one's plus one. All right. So with that said, we can solve for the eigen values of n, and thus the eigenvalues of h. By the way, go back to this picture of the harmonic oscillator. What can you tell me about the spectrum, let's say the set of eigenvalues of the harmonic oscillator? Is there a continuum? This potential, as a harmonic potential, goes off to infinity. Which means of all the states, all the in a harmonic potential, everything is a bound state. There are no unbound states. But there's infinitely many bound states. It's true, but they're not. It's not. It's not a continuum. Okay. It's discrete. So all that you have only bound states. There are no unbound states of harmonic. So the entire spectrum of the harmonic oscillator potential is discrete. It's like an infinite square well, but not like the finite square well. The finite square well has both discrete and continuous eigenvalues. All right, back to where we were. Um, all right, so lemma. Everyone loves a lemma. Um, if I apply A to this eigenvector of N, it is also an eigenvector of N. with eigenvalue around the n minus 1. And similarly, if I apply this, this guy is an eigenvector of n with eigenvalue around the n plus 1. How do we do that? Well, it's easy to check. That's that just the raising of lower numbers, aren't they? Yes, that's what we're deriving. That's what we're just derived. Indeed. That's what it means. So, N acting on this is equal to the commutator of N with A plus N. That's how you use the commutator. You write them in the other order. And you add the commutator. And we just said that this was equal to minus A. Right? So this then says that this is equal. And since this is an eigenvector with eigenvalue lambda n, this is lambda n minus 1 on that. By the same argument, Using the other commutator, this is lambda n plus 1. So it increases the eigenvalue by 1, 
or lowers it by one. Okay? Now, what are the eigenvalues? Well, to show that, that in fact they are the integers, the non-negative integers, you use the following fact. Note, and the positive operator. What happened to the A there? You have a, you're ending on A dot A of U and you have a, you have a lambda minus one times A U. Where did, where did A come from? Uh, sorry, they should have any data here. Pardon me. So, I operated A on this. Oh, I, I, okay. I, I, I thought that you made, you made it to the A by accident. No, no, but you see the A is there for the following reason. When I do the commutator, N acts on that, gives me lambda. So then I get lambda minus 1. Right? All right. So, uh, what I'm saying here is that N is a positive operator. How do we know that? Well, to be a positive operator, it means the expectation value of this is greater than or equal to zero for all stuff. How do we see that? Well, if we plug in for with a This equals that, right? But this is equal to the norm squared of that. And that's a positive number, or a non-negative number, I should say. It can be 0. Well, what it says is that uh, If this is zero, then it's annihilated. It's the only possible way. That's why A is known as the annihilation operator. Now, what state does it annihilate? Well, how can we see that? Uh, well, uh, what we said is that if we apply A to one of the eigenstates of the, of the number operator, we get another eigenstate with eigenvalue decreased by 1. If I do it twice, the same thing, I get an eigenvector with eigenvalue that's decreased by two units. If I do it three times, three units. If I do it n times, it's decreased n units. However, however, because n is a positive operator, it has positive eigenvalues. Which means that at some point, this screws up, because this will start being negative. Which means there's got to be a minimum n which, below which I can't, not, I can't lower anymore. There must exist a minimum value of lambda. It can't go to minus infinity because this is a positive operator. It means it's either that is a positive. And what this implies is that there exists a minimum case 
such that A just annihilates it. It doesn't lower it any further to any lower eigenvalues. The only possible way to be consistent. Okay. So, if that's true, then what is the eigenvalue of the number operator on this state I'm calling u0? Well, that's a dagger a acting on u0. But u0 is annihilated by a. So this is 0. So that implies that lambda 0 is 0. Lambda 1 is 1 more. And lambda n is n. QED. Thus, the eigenvalues of n are the natural numbers. And thus we call n. the number operator. A and A dagger are play the role here of annihilation and creation or the latter operators. That is to say, so by the way, we'll, for, for shorthand, from now on, we'll just label this n by its label n. Okay? So, this has got to be proportional to n minus 1. And a dagger gives us something proportional to n plus 1. It raises and lowers. And a on the n equals 0 is the null thing. Finally, what is the proportionality constant? So, let's say A on N is some constant. We want to know what that proportionality constant is. What we can do is multiply it by its adjoint. This is a normalized vector, so this is 1. This is the number operator. So what is this expectation value? It's just n, right? So that tells me that this proportionality constant is some phase times the square root of n. And by convention, we choose that to be 1. That's by convention. There's nothing, nothing that fixes that phase. We just choose it by convention. So what we have is that this is equal to square root of n, n minus 1. And if you go through the same algebra, this is the square root of n plus 1.
finally, if you do this over and over again, what you can show is that n is equal to, well, you raise this n times on the ground state, and then you know. The lowest energy state of n is the ground state of a harmonic oscillator. So n equals zero. Yeah. Okay. So the energy eigenvalues